When I was 18 years old, I was the bus driver for the school that I went to, Bay St. Louis High School. And one of the tough bus driving experiences was to take the bands to New Orleans. I was also active in the band. I was a drummer uh, in the band. And so it was uh, a dark and dreary and rainy night, misty. When we came back from the Comus Parade, we had gone to New Orleans from Bay St. Louis and marched for 11 miles in that parade. Let me tell you how long, how far 11 miles is in a carnival parade. Uh, a girl named Martin, Lynn Martin, in our group had bought a new pair of loafers to march. This is not smart. Her poor little ankles and all were just so badly damaged, but she was walking on the soles of her socks when the parade was done. Uh, that's, a, that's quite a march. Anyway, on the way back, we were on the way to the home of Milton and Hugo Favre, uh, distantly related to that other Favre that plays with pigskin. And um, <laughs> they were really big believers in ghosts. And they were always telling us about how these ghosts got into their lives and how they affected their relationships and all that kind of stuff. And we're driving in this dark and stormy night, you know, with lightning cracking every now and then. And then all of a sudden, one of our girls says very loudly, ghost, look, it's a ghost. And I look over there, and there's this shiny thing. And all of a sudden, it disappears. And um, so they said, it's a ghost. And I said, no, it's not a ghost. They said, it is a ghost. And I said, it's not. And they said, how are you going to prove it? I said, I'm going to go out and see. And they all said, oh. <laughs> there was this guy, Ronnie Meridgi, and he was big and bad, fullback type, you know. And I said, Ronnie, come on with me. He said, not me, coach. <laughs> I'm not going, and so I started there, and I got about halfway there, and all of a sudden, lightning, and whoosh, kind of a red glow and all that kind of stuff, and I wasn't afraid, but my tummy did tighten just a little teeny bit, you know, and finally, I got a little closer, and the next time the lightning came and the thunder thundered, I saw that it was a cow, <laughs> and the lightning reflected off of those great big eyes did some very interesting things. <laughs> You know, I'm kind of like my Cajun uncle. I don't believe in ghosts, but every time you talk about them, I shag boogie to the north. <laughs> we used to call the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost. And I think it's an interesting thing because in that day and that time, perhaps it didn't connotate what it does to us. But to us, it's sort of the voodoo. It's sort of the mystery. It's sort of the scary. It's sort of the unreal in many ways. And I prefer to call the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, so you can sort of call reality whatever name you choose to give. But I think the church needs to hear the message again of the active presence and power and person of the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God that created the world, the Spirit of God that came to us and comes to us through the Spirit of Jesus, and the Spirit of God that created Pentecost and the life of the church and the vitality of the church along the way. So, number one, it doesn't matter what you call it. It does matter whether or not you receive it. This particular experience was with a group of people who were disciples. They were believers. They were not people standing on the outside looking in. This was a group of people who actually had already found reason to walk the way of Christ, uh, to be men and women of faith. What they needed was some kind of an affirmation and some kind of an assurance. And so what happens in this particular passage is that that Reality is given to them, but you have to be a receiver in order to get it. Uh, receiving things means a lot, and being willing and open to receive things uh, calls for a kind of humility. We were talking about it in Sunday school just a little while ago. You can be a giver and in charge of things, but when you're a receiver and when you're receiving something that you have to have more than anything else, the only thing you can do is humble your heart and open your spirit and be willing to receive. And so the bottom line is that even though these disciples were together, and even though they had learned some things, they were like the rest of us. They had a lot more to grow and a lot more to know. And if you ever get to the place that you stop growing, that's the place when you die. Whenever you get to the place that you're not open to what God might yet do, that's the place when things sort of fall apart at the seams. And so to be a receiver, receiver and a recipient of the Holy Spirit is extremely important. A lot of us, if I say to you, do you have faith? We'd say, uh-huh. Uh, is it important to you? Well, uh-huh. 
you know, especially when I'm sick or broke or dead. And, uh, you know, it sort of relates to me. And, but it's not very much of a faith alive. And I would imagine there were people back then, as there were people right now, they knew the right beliefs. Um, they made themselves available. They got around like that. But they never did have that empowering moment. They never did have that vitality. They never did have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when it comes, it comes in unique ways. See, lots of times we think that we know exactly how to describe it. For example, it's going to cause somebody to get up and dance in the Spirit. Incidentally, during the song, I saw a lot of people kind of moving their feet around, you know. And I saw some of you enjoying Jan's dance, <laughs> this Jan's that she plays. And one of the kids was dancing right back at the window in the cry room, so I got a chance to do that kind of stuff. It should free you to new motion. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to do something that you don't want to do. It doesn't mean that when the Holy Spirit touches and blesses and fills your life that you're going to hold your hands up or fall out on the floor or speak in strange tongues. It does happen. It did happen. And if that happens, it's okay. But let me tell you the important thing about it. Not what your ecstatic response is, but what happens after that. Where do you go as a result of that? You know, uh, some people say, every now and then people say, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? And you say, by the grace of God. And, oh, then you speak in tongues? Well, not necessarily. There are some people who do, and there are some people that don't. My mama said, I've been speaking in tongues ever since I've been speaking. <laughs> You know, occasions do that. We used to love to get on the elevator when I was 11 or 12 years old, and there'd be other people in there, and we would say, You know, what is that? Speaking in tongues? <laughs> I don't know what the devil it is, you know. One of the interesting phenomena is speaking in tongues is that sometimes it comes across as another language. There were people that heard, remember on Pentecost? They spoke and people heard their language. So it seems to me that the results, the power, the meaning, the value of any kind of experience like that is new understanding. It's being able to hear what you haven't heard before. Being able to say maybe what you haven't been willing to say before. We have some wonderful people that come to our church that sit here patiently and lovingly and don't hear a word in their own language. So I'm going to try this just for at least a few of those people. Dios quiere baptizar ustedes con sus espíritus sanctos. God wants to baptize you with his Holy Spirit. God wants to take each of us and allow us in the context of our own person and our own personality and our own way to receive the Holy Spirit, if you're willing to do it. And when you do receive it, you find yourself redirected. You find yourself vitalized. You find yourself sort of resurrected, uh, sort of coming alive in spirit in ways that you hadn't been alive before. It never means that you have to follow the pattern of someone else's spirituality. It always means that you have to walk in your own integrity. Um, take a look at Psalms 26, verse 1, sometimes when you get a chance in the King James Version. I have walked in mine own integrity. That's the call of God to you and to me in the life of faith. Have we received the Holy Spirit? What? Um, it's the Holy Spirit of God. The spirit that's willing to be willing to come to us. Sometimes it happens in worship, right here. We've seen it happen many times. I hope it'll happen today. I believe it will happen today. You may not want to say it. You may not respond to it in a way that I'll see. But I hope and pray that you won't come to church and go away from this place empty of spirit. And if the spirit comes, that's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it happens at a special event like Crucio. And sometimes at Kairos for people. Or sometimes at a revival meeting. Or sometimes at a small group of people getting together. Sometimes at Disciple Bible Study, we've seen the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Disciple Bible Study. I've got to tell you this, every time, now and then people say to me, I wish y'all would study the Bible more. You know what I want to respond to that? I wish you'd come when we do. <laughs> <laughs> on Sunday evenings, we do line by line, preaching, teaching. On Wednesday, we take the Bible book by book. We have Disciple Bible classes. There's no Bible study like it that I know of because most Bible studies are uh, created to indoctrinate people to a way of faith. Our Bible studies are created to introduce you to the Scripture and to believe that the Holy Spirit can lead you to the truth contained therein. That's really unique. That's really special. Um, the Holy Spirit sometimes comes in loud moments and sometimes very soft ones. Some of you all will remember this, but I took some of the young people in my congregation to a Pentecostal church because we love all of God's people. And there was a lady in front of us with a huge purse. 
And the kids kept on saying, what in the world is that woman carrying that purse? That's so huge. And one of the boys said, maybe it's something to eat. <laughs> I wouldn't have been surprised. But anyway, as the service got going, she opened that purse up, and she got out the biggest cymbals you ever saw, and she started playing those cymbals. Boy, it turned a lot of us on, you know. Um, the scriptures say, worship God with cymbals, with loud crashing cymbals. That's Psalm 150. You know that. But you know, and for somebody else, it might be, for example, I noticed just the other day, somebody received the Holy Spirit like this in a moment when, watch, there was not a word, there was not a song, the person simply said, see, it is not ours to direct the eternal spirit of God. It is ours to be blessed by and to receive the eternal spirit. Spirit of God. We had Christmas at Baton Rouge this year. That changes a thousand years of tradition in our family because families always come to the eldest, say, but now Tracy's got three little kids in the house and they want to have Christmas. So anyway, forget that first part. That was petty. No spirit in it except ugly. But anyway, uh, so we go there and it is neat. Uh, we got there a little late because, of course, we had our late service here, but they'd opened some of their presents, but some of the presents we brought were big ones, and there was a particularly big one sitting near the tree. And uh, the little two, the, 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 the baby, of course, too young to understand it, but the two boys kept on wondering, they'd look at that big one, whose is that? Whose is that? And I heard Porter say to his daddy, who was playing Santa Claus at that point, can I open it now? Can I open it now? And his daddy would say, not yet, not yet. You know, and uh, finally, we went through all the presents and came to the time. Can I open it now? Can I open it? Yes, you can open it now. And so he opened it. It was some kind of a little gift, which is a teaching tool and a play tool and all that kind of stuff, you know. And he opened the gift, and it was his. That's the Holy Spirit of God. The gift is present. The gift is to be opened. The gift is yours. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Will you receive the Holy Spirit? You need not ever be afraid because God will never hurt you or harm you. It is the will of God to heal you and to stand you on your feet and to resurrect your soul and to allow you to say in your own way, praise God, hallelujah, amen. Let's pray.